Hello and welcome. Comments and questions. Moving straight on with those. So, uh, sometimes when you speak about the three marks of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, making a quick mention about the meaning of these three terms, you say things are not in our control when referring to anatta. Can you please elaborate on this? Yes, well there is a video, if you search on this channel, uh, English Buddhist monk, Anatta or not self, all about elaborating on this subject, but I usually refer to it, as you say, mentioning it quickly, in simple terms of, how do I word it, you say, not in our control, things are not in our control, because in the context of anatta, our physical bodies and these thinking brains um, are not within our control. It's as simple as that. This physical body ages, gets sick and dies, and this thinking brain, it thinks on. We cannot control it. We can train it by practicing sila, samadhi, panya, keeping moral virtue, meditation, developing wisdom, to have more wholesome states of mind, good thoughts, and to reduce unwholesome states of mind, not so good thoughts with time, but we cannot control it. And this is the very real sense, a very, very real sense in which we can understand the principle of not self. So this you see here, sitting, talking to you, that I experience as myself sitting here, talking to you by way of convention, because we are a named person doing a certain type of thing in a certain context. This is conditionality. This is conditioned things. And all conditioned things are a nature, impermanent. All conditioned things are dukkha, unsatisfactory. And I say anatta, out of our control. So without going into the whole depth of what I've spoken about previously with regards to the principle of not-self, it is usually simpler to just explain it that way and it's simpler for us to understand and come to terms with it when we look at our own bodies as not being ours, not in our control and not in our possession. And this also applies even to our thinking brains. We do not even know what our next thought will be. Uh, this is more just a comment. Greatness, greatness lasts forever. Or well, back to what I was just saying there. I think this is going to be the theme today. But a Nietzsche, all conditioned things are impermanent. Greatness is a condition of comparison. It's a condition of, uh, in respect to beings, a great being is only in the context of that lifetime or that existence in whichever realm this may be, uh, as opposed to ungreatness, whatever the opposite of greatness is. Uh, one is great by comparison, some form of conceit, from the perspective of the great, or even conceit 
from another perspective seeing something or someone as greater than you. It is all conditioned. So I wouldn't say that greatness or any conditioned thing, as I've just spoken of, lasts forever. All conditioned things, we call sankara in the Pali word, are impermanent, so not lasting forever. In the Buddhist, in Buddhist philosophy, there are gods in heavenly realms and uh, devas. Even those are not permanent, not in the same sense as one regards in theistic faiths, for instance Christianity, where there is a permanent God and a permanent heaven. In terms of Buddhism, this all comes under, there's not saying there are no gods, there may be one, there may be plenty of them. There may be many kinds of heavenly realms. In Buddhist philosophy, there are many mentioned. Whether one believes in these or not, the principle still applies. They are impermanent as being conditioned things. So rebirth, even into heavenly realms, is still rebirth. And freedom from suffering comes about through no more birth into aging, sickness and death, or even into what may seem for a very long time the heavenly realms, but realms of which, which are even harder to become free from because there is less suffering and therefore less incentive to become liberated from suffering in that lifetime, this lifetime, and attain to Nibbana, Padi Nibbana, where there is no further rebirth into samsara in, which, in whichever realm. Uh, how does a monk find fulfillment, meditations, and good character stroke conduct? Well, by following the Buddha's teachings and practicing sila, samadhi, panya. Uh, sila being moral virtue, samadhi, meditation, panya, as described in the Noble Eightfold Path. So developing right view, which is panya, wisdom. Keeping sila, which is right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And practicing meditation, which is right effort, right mindfulness, right meditation. Samadhi. Practicing this is how we establish moral virtue, the ability to focus our minds, develop wholesome mind states, reduce unwholesome mind states, and enjoy absorbed states of meditation we call samadhi. I wonder if there are any practices that can be used to develop sadha, something to strengthen and to make sadha firm so that it won't be forgotten in the midst of the mundane daily life. Sadha is usually translated, it's another Pali word, as faith or more recently we hear the word confidence, confidence in the teachings of the Buddha and the Dharma those teachings, and that also describes to all of natural uh, conditions, conditioned things, so nature, uh, and um, the Sangha, that is uh, the uh, disciples of the Buddha, and their lineage of ordained monks and nuns that have continued to practice uh, as directly taught by the Buddha. 2,567 years ago, and continue to do so to this day, sharing the teachings of the Buddha, that Dharma, and also demonstrating by way of practice their lifestyle, the way they live, how this uh, is actually put, this, this, demonstrating by example this way of life. How does one strengthen? How does one uh, practice to develop uh, sadha. Again, it is by following and practicing in the way the Buddha taught us. 
By following the Noble Eightfold Path and practicing Sila Samadhi Panya, you will see results. Results in your own state of mind becoming more peaceful and tranquil, with more metta, loving kindness, more karuna, compassion, with mudita, joy for others, and eventually with equanimity, upekka, these four we call Brahma Viharas, heavenly realms, abodes, which are qualities we develop within through this practice, seeing this develop in oneself, seeing the benefits, the results of our practice, is no there is no better way to establish confidence in that practice. The Buddha does not ask us to believe. This is why sadha is often translated as confidence rather than faith, because faith can imply, in the traditional sense of theistic religions, a belief system. And there is nothing to be believed, only to be practiced for oneself and experienced by oneself, its results. So practicing Sila Samadhi Panya will give you results that are tangible, evident, visible, experiential, and will build, strengthen, and establish sadha, confidence in that practice, in the Dharma, in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Just like that, just that. Sila Samadhi Panya, again. Establishing a monastery, temple, wherever we are. Would it be possible without dealing with money? For monks, it has to be. Monks don't handle, deal with money, negotiate, or are not able to implement transactions of any kind. Uh, but that rather than that, rely on lay people, their supporters, whom can do so, when we're just on five presets, to uh, do that for them. So uh, if one is purchasing land, building buildings, and all of this kind of thing to build monasteries, then you know that's going to require probably transactions of a monetary nature at some uh, point. This is all handled by supporters of the Sangha, that monastery and its development. So it is in ownership, it is in practical terms, the responsibility and the property of the lay followers to that particular Sangha, that particular monastery, not the monks themselves. Uh, however, really a monastery uh, is really where just a monk lives. So a monk can go wandering on his own, as I do, establish one's self in a place. It could be in the forest, it can be in a cave, in the open air, under a tree, or an empty building, as I often find myself. And this is where a monk lives, and that's what a monastery means. It doesn't have to be a big community with big temples, salas, stupas, and lots of goings on. It can be just that, a monk living alone. Now this doesn't require any money, because the monk of course cannot pay rent, cannot buy property, doesn't have use of, or any money to use. So, is reliant on the support of lay people for clothing, our robes, food uh, offered to us each day in our bowl on arms round, and shelter provided by either nature under a tree or the open air, or if there's an empty building and someone allows you to stay there by whomever maybe owns that, or if it's unowned, just to be able to make use of what is available. This does not require money. Now that is truly a monastery and a temple where a monk is practicing. This situation can and usually does grow. Other people will come to visit, they may bring things, they may help to make the place more comfortable, a better environment for them to visit you, for you to live and practice in, and maybe that requires money. But it is not of the concern of the bhikkhu or the bhikkhunis. The monks, the nuns, are not involved with financial transactions. Our tenth precept is specifically that we don't handle gold and silver, but that's translated literally 
um, it means just that. But really, its meaning at the time when it was written down of the Buddha was using money because that was the form of money in that time, precious metal uh, in exchange for goods. So uh, we now take it as being money for the purpose of not making our lives inconvenient but for the firm establishment and basis of renunciation. Because after all, if you've got a pocket full of money and however much you've renounced, you've always the ability to go and buy whatever you want if you're allowed to use money, for instance. So we take the precept as very strictly in Theravada Buddhism to mean that we should not and do not use money. Um, because it then would mean that we're really not that different from lay practitioners whom can use money. Because of course we, with money you can buy anything. It's also um, open to misuse in terms of you, well, we don't need to go into all of that. Where there is no money, there is nothing complicated. Life remains very simple. Our requisites are simple. Food, clothing, shelter and medicine. And as long as they're provided for, we can remain as renunciants bhikkhu, as, as alms mendicants, as renunciant bhikkhus or bhikkhunis. <clears throat> Bhante is the cessation of feeling and perception, the experience that results in being an arahant or anagami, or are these attainments just necessary to access that state? Is the cessation of feeling and perception the experience that results in being an arahant or anagami, or are these just attainments or are these attainments just necessary to access that state? So really, yes, and so an arahant is the final stage of attainment where one um, is uh, fully secluded from the, the five hindrances, of course. I mean, that comes uh, at uh, Anagami, if not even Sat Sak Sakadagami. Uh, these terms are the four stages of enlightenment. Sotapanna, or stream entra, Sakadagami, or uh, once returner, uh, Anagami, non-returner, and Arahant, fully enlightened. With regards to stream entra, once returner, non returner, this is referring to rebirth in the human realm. Stream entra is referring to en entering the stream. Uh, so if we see nibbana or arahantship as an island, fully secluded, an island, we're entering the stream to get to the other side, but we still have a way to go. At this stage, we abandon personality view rites and rituals, and we have full confidence in the Noble Eightfold Path, or the Four Noble Truths, rather, and the Noble Eightfold Path. Sakadagami, once returner, we would enter the stream, get to the island, but may well go back to the other side again, by way of rebirth, um, and Sakadagami has a number of rebirths that are possible, as does Sotapanna in the human realm, seven in the case of Sotapanna, but we don't need to concern ourselves too much with that. But the practice of Sila Samadhi Panya to get us there is what we should be concerning ourselves with. So Anagami is referring to rebirth back into the human realm, and sorry, Sakadagami. Anagami is no further is, is non-returner. So you will not be birth reborn in the human realm, but rather higher realms such as heavenly realms. Again, we're not aiming for any realms, we're aiming for freedom from suffering in this lifetime, liberation from samsara or liberation from rebirth 
is our goal, not a particular destination. A particular destination would be attaching to something and therefore putting us right back prior to the stage of first stage of enlightenment, Sotapanna, if we're attached to the idea of being reborn in two-seater he heavenly realm or something like that, this is attachment to rebirth. So we're, we're by no way enlightened. These fetters that we're slowly breaking down, cutting, detaching ourselves from, that tie us into rebirth, are slowly being broken away. Now there's not much difference between Sakadagami and Anagami. It's a gradual reduction in those ties of sensual desire and ill will that are uh, giving us the incentive to uh, the incentive for rebirth uh, and the aversion uh, that is also propelling us in a particular direction via our karmic our actions of body, speech and mind. So what do we need? Uh, to the cessation of feeling and perception is to be experienced in the deep absorbed states of uh, meditation, samadhi, um, leading into the jhanas. One needs to be able to establish those to be on the path towards even Sotapanna or Sakadagami or Anagami or Arahant to be on the path towards them. They're not necessarily a guarantee that you will attain to Arahantship. It is a progressive path, slowly eroding the fetters. Now, there is a talk on here about the four stages of enlightenment, which goes into those stages and also of the stages of Samadhi and Jhanas. I think that's a separate talk quite in detail as to what leads to arahantship. But one will, through our practice, establish an experience which can be compared to the attainment of a nibbana, of nibbana or arahantship, maybe a glimpse of nibbana, but this isn't arahantship. Arahantship is the final detachment, the final, um, I mean, you're referring to two things here, so we'll just deal with Arahant for, for the time being. So in terms of what the question is asking is which comes first? Well, the practice is always first. Again, the practice of Sila Samadhi Panya, you will experience cessation of feeling and perception you also feel, experience the cessation of the five khandhas. The, this is in the rupa jhanas, the experience of uh, me mental perception and physical feeling uh, uh, going away in a deep state of absorption. But one would have to progress further in one's practice to attain to arahantship. So I'm not really quite sure that I understand or I've answered correctly what you're asking, but one practices to attain these end goals. One doesn't just have to get these end goals and then has the benefits of these experiences. These are on the way to those end goals. Pante, are there any mantras in Theravada unlike, I think you mean like, Mahayana Vajrayana. <clears throat> well, I, uh, not, not so much. We have chanting, which is uh, pretty much evident if you watch some of the morning puja videos on here or look at the uh, Pali chanting book. You can see the chanting that we have. Um, as far as the short repetitive mantras like Om Mani Padmi Hom um, and this kind of thing, 
No, there, there isn't this, this practice so much. Very much in Thailand, the single word, two syllable word, butto, 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 is used as a way of focusing the attention on that as a meditation object to help settle, clear, and allow the mind to become tranquil. So uh, that's as far as it goes. But as for these um, other mantras, they're not really, no. Okay, this is quite a long one. Let's find the question. Can you please talk about how you deal with... Hang on. You mentioned to accept all offerings, but in your practice you are not obliged to take absolutely everything also. Right, okay, I think you're just summing up my video, I'm not sure. Right, can you please talk about how you deal with patronizing attitude and what can a lay person do in order to keep peace and equilibrium? So peace and equilibrium or, uh, uh, or equanimity, rupeka, are really the qualities we are trying to develop through this practice. So what can we do? Well, to develop those qualities, I've said it many times already in this video, we practice Siddha Samadhi Panya. Panya is wisdom, it's developing the understanding of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Now, within this, we understand wisdom, we understand that uh, everything, all conditioned things are impermanent, unsatisfactory and, uh, and out of our control, and that being anatta, not self, these bodies. And with that, as understanding alone, anicca, dukkha, anatta, it is enough to know that really someone can say or do anything to us. When this, uh, this is established so firmly rooted uh, in your wisdom, that this body is not yours, even physical harm uh, given by others towards you, you know, people harming you, uh, can be seen as somewhat insignificant. After all, this is just this physical body. You're not actually harming uh, anything other than this bag of flesh and bones. As far as the way someone talks to you, or the words that are said, let's start with extreme, you know, if people are aggressive, are they directing or insulting you? One can just know this as hearing. Again, this is equilibrium, or as you word it, but equanimity, upaka, that is developed through the practice holistically, through practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, right in there is right speech, right at the top, the third. And that covers the way we respond, the way we speak to people. So if people are speaking to us in a derogatory fashion or a patronizing fashion, which can be just associated and seen as the same as insulting speech, it's something you don't like. It's a way of someone speaking to you with a tone that is to uh, most people's, in most people's opinion, insulting. Insulting of what we have established as being our own righteousness, which is very much a, 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 a perspective of self, which is again something we're trying to eradicate. So even this personality, we may think we are the, for instance, the, the, the best uh, chef or cook in the world. We, we're such a wonderful, we're, we're a, working in a high top class restaurant. And then somebody comes along and tells you, uh, how to practice, how to make something very simple in a very basic way. And you may say, hey look, I'm the best chef in the world, why are you talking to me like that, telling me how to do this uh, uh, in, in, in this way? You would consider it patronizing, but only because you consider yourself as better than them. This is conceit, this is personality view. So it's the holistic overall practice that reduces all of these. So when someone is talking to you in a, a way you don't like, which is what it, it, it actually is what it boils down to, is you do not like the way they're talking to you. You have aversion to 
that patronizing attitude. When this happens, you should know that it's only that aversion, that self-righteousness, that is making you feel like reacting rather than becoming being equanimous and not reacting. So it's the same answer by practicing. Only this way you will develop panya, wisdom, wholesome states of mind, and through sila, through the overall practice of Noble Eightfold Path, be unable to respond in anything but an, an, an equanimous way. So I think, I uh, hope that answers that. Uh, are tattoos allowed, even the not exposed ones? Uh, monks um, come to be ordained and it doesn't matter what they look like if they have tattoos already, that's uh, not a problem. Um, however, as a monk you wouldn't then go on to have more tattoos, that would be it, because there's no point to them, what, what, there's, there's no reason, it's just adornments, um, beautification, it comes under that in the eight precepts, number seven. Um, so uh, there's no reason uh, for, for you to have more. Now I know you see maybe there are some in traditions in Thailand where there are monks giving tattoos. This is another whole cultural influence which is aside and not, not within the teachings of the Buddha, within the suttas. But yes, if you already have tattoos, then that's, um, that's um, like if you have a mole or anything like this. It's not a consideration. Right. As a Westerner new to practicing Buddhism, what would you, what would be appropriate, if anything, to bring to the Thai Sangha celebrating Magha Puja? So I'm a bit late for that one, aren't I? But the same for any of the Buddhist festivals and I think really the same for any day when you visit any Sangha, whether it's the Thai or I'm not sure what country you're in or where, where you're visiting a monastery, I guess, um, then the requisites are of clothing, robes, food, uh, consumables, uh, things like that. Um, usually they're in established shelter already, so not so much shelter. Uh, but things that shelters require, like cleaning fluids, washing powder, things like that, detergents or whatever, um, and medicines, you know, simple medicines like um, maybe, I don't know, paracetamol or something like that, that, or, you know, some vitamin supplements, things like that. These are the normal things, but it depends where you are, what country you're in, what time you're going in the day. It's the same though, any time you see monks or you visit the Sangha, However, afternoon, uh, you shouldn't offer monks food, uh, but, uh, bearing in mind they can't store food overnight. So, but if you're going to a monastery in the afternoon, you can take non-perishables. The best thing to do is to, if you have the opportunity, to find out from, the, from other lay people, or if it's a big monastery with an office and lay people working there, organizing things, you might be able to find there or ask there or see on a website if they have a list of requirements, they sometimes do. But essentially all monks need is food, clothing, medicine and shelter. And more actually the specific requirements for monks is food and sometimes medicine. But if you're going in the morning, it's easy. You can take food and things like that. In the afternoon, we cannot eat solid food, but you can take drinks like tea, coffee. So not prepared tea and coffee with milk. And sometimes monks might not want sugar. They should be drinking just black tea, black coffee. But sugar, sweet drinks is allowed. Even soft drinks, not thick fruit juice, but thin, if that makes any sense, strained fruit juice. We just don't eat solid food afternoon. But all monks, all, bish all monasteries have slightly different uh, views on this. 
So as far as this specific question you're asking, I don't know where you're going to visit. Maybe check with them first. Otherwise, the safe bet is, is to take things like soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, razor blades, even buckets and cloths and things like that. Are always safe. They're imperishable. They're not food. They're useful. They're things, brooms. They're things that the, the, the community will use. Uh, oh, that's the same question. Sorry. Uh, how do you travel from country to country without buying a flight stroke boat ticket? So the same as the previous question about monasteries. Uh, well, I'm usually invited or told to go somewhere and whomever's told me to go there or invited me will uh, accompany that invitation eventually with the necessary means to get there. So a ticket uh, and uh, if it's necessary, any, what else did you say? Or, or boat, yeah. Um, I, also visa um, expenses and things like that. So um, yes, I mean, again, once again, this is something that we depend on lay people for. And uh, if I'm invited to go or told to go somewhere, then if they don't offer, then one would have to say, uh, that um, we'd have to get someone or we'd have to explain to them that we can only obviously go somewhere if someone provides us with the, the, the vehicle. You know, even just to go up the road costs people money, doesn't it? Not far, don't have to go to another country. But I can't just jump in a car and drive. Um, and I can't, uh, in fact, I can just jump on a bus here because they don't charge monks. They know that we don't use money, so it's free. And usually if I'm walking along the road, a tuk-tuk will pick me up, so that's free. Um, and the trains similarly. But ordinarily speaking, not in a Buddhist country, that isn't the case. So we can't do that. We're dependent on lay people. So if someone asks me to go up the road to see them at their house for some reason or another, then you would have to say thank you for the invitation uh, uh, but you do understand you will need to provide me with the means to get there if you're very happy if you're happy to go and they will do that whether it's up the road or whether it's the other side of the wo road the world it's uh, neither here nor there we require the the people inviting us the lay people to pay for that make it possible So, um, I had to find a shortish question now. So I think we're, oh, they're all very long. Okay, so. Uh, these two questions are related. I won't, they're very long. The reason they're very long is because, as usual, uh, first question, sorry if you have already done a video on this, but what are your thoughts on marijuana? So, no need to be sorry, but I have spoken about intoxicants, the fifth precepts, and my thoughts on that. But then you go on to, in a long statement, justify all of the, well, the negative and the positive aspects of it. It's an intoxicant, it's breaking the fifth precept, so it has to be avoided. That is not my thoughts, that is what the Buddha taught us. For the very simple reason that if we affect our mindfulness, we cannot practice. Now the next question is similarly about alcohol, but isn't it okay to drink in company, um, in social circumstances, with uncle this or grandfather that, who offers you a small drink to have with him to keep him company. No, there is no excuse. No one is going to be offended or berate you for saying, 
I'll join you in a soft drink. And they might, I suppose, in the West, think you're a little different. But these days, I don't think anyone's going to consider it too negative or criticize you uh, as a result of turning down alcohol. However long your explanation, the reasoning behind it, cultural influences, social situations, there is no justification for breaching any of the five precepts. If you do, it is your karma, it is your own actions which will have their results, vipaka. So again, the same as marijuana, alcohol is an intoxicant and to be avoided. So on that note, on those two uh, questions, comments, I shall bring that to an end for now and hope there is something in there that you can find useful incorporate into your practice, uh, help towards your understanding of the Dharma and the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, if not, then please just let it go and don't let it bother you. Be happy and stay well. Until next time, Sukihotu.